and I'd like to welcome all of you in the audience tonight, particularly those who've travelled a long way to be here, and Professor Almut Hintz's friends, colleagues and family. Uh, husband, her son William and a niece are here. Uh, son William said to me, well, at least it meant he didn't have to do his physics homework. <laughs> I'd like to extend a special welcome to those guests from the Zoroastrian community, which has been very supportive to SAS over the years. We have guests uh, from all over the place tonight. We really appreciate you all taking the trouble. It all adds to the occasion that is a SAS inaugural. SAS does its uh, inaugurals are very special. They're a ceremony, they're a rite passage for the uh, speaker, they're a celebration uh, of intellectual achievement, and they're an enjoyable event for all in this whole SAS community. Now, to make sure it's an enjoyable event, I do need to do a bit of simple housekeeping at the outset. So please turn off your mobile phones. I always forget to do this myself. So here we are, turning off his mobile phone. Excellent. Uh, and do note where the fire exits are. They're the things that say fire exit. <laughs> now I'm very pleased to preside over this particular inaugural lecture, which is the second inaugural lecture of this academic session, the first that I've been able to attend. I think it's going to be really, really interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, I think, actually, I visited the Zoroastrian Centre in Rainer's Lane, and I was both moved and fascinated by the ritual. I was very impressed by the members of the community I met, so I'm really looking forward to learning more about the archaic and innovative features of Zoroastrian religious belief and practice. Alma did give me some guidance when I was there, so I understood a little what was going on, but I'm sure I will understand more after this lecture. Professor Hintzer will be introduced by Professor John Hinnells, uh, who's very well known to all at SAS. Professor Hinnells has held professorial appointments at the University of Manchester, Derby, Liverpool Hope, but most importantly of all, at SAS. Uh, he's a scholar of very great distinction. He's published very widely in the area of South Asian religion, in particular the Parsis, and the comparative study of religions more widely. And we're very grateful to you indeed, John, for coming here tonight. At the end, the vote of thanks will be given by Professor Maria Matsu, who you saw come on, of the Free University Berlin. Uh, she's Professor of Iranian Studies. She's been head of the Institute of Iranian Studies in Berlin since 1995. She's been editor of the series Iranica since 1993, and a main area of research focused on pre-Islamic Iran, especially Zoroastrian Sasanian legal system. I hope I pronounced that correctly, and its impact on other legal cultures. We're also very grateful to you as well, Maria, for turning up to this event. It should be wonderful. So to introduce Professor Hintzer, I'm now going to pass over to Professor Hennels. Over to you. It's a great joy to me uh, to introduce Professor Almut Hintzer tonight. We have known each other for many years, and we first met in the early 1980s, and we've remained friends ever since. When I wrote a few years ago a reference for her promotion to a senior lectureship, I said I thought it would not be long before the school was considering her for a professorship. And I'm delighted that she now has that post and rightly deserves it. There could not be a better holder of the first Zartashti professorship in Zoroastrian studies. She has, as I shall outline in a moment, the highest academic qualifications. She has a deep love for the Zoroastrian community and they for her. And it's a tribute to her that so many of the community are here tonight. She has had a distinguished career. She did her early graduate studies at Heidelberg before starting her postgraduate work at Wadham College, Oxford. She moved into Iranian and Zoroastrian studies at Erlangen for her PhD on the important text, the Zamyad Yasht. After that, she did her habilitation in Berlin, where she became an assistant professor. She has had visiting posts at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton and at Cambridge equivalent Clare Hall, a college exclusively concerned with research. 
She has been associated with SOAS now for 14 years, rising from a part-time lecturer to a full professor. She has held many distinguished awards, for example, the Heisenberg Research Scholarship at the German National Research Association in Bonn, and a British Academy readership from 2004 to 2006. She is being recognised in many international learned bodies, notably as Secretary of the Corpus Inscriptionum Iranicarum, in which role she is following in the footsteps of Professor Mary Boyce. And she's been elected president of the Societas Iranologica Europea for the years 2011 to 2015. She has been trustee, secretary, and treasurer of the learned body, the Ancient India and Iran Trust in Cambridge. Her career achievements are based on a fine linguistic ability and her profound grasp of Zoroastrian doctrine and practice. She has authored 16, six scholarly books, edited three more, and written 25 chapters in learned books, all of a very high scholarly standard. She has several scholarly articles and two books in hand at the moment, leading towards her introduction to Zoroastrianism for Cambridge University Press, a book I anticipate will become a standard work. I have read most of her publications and they are all characterised by rigour, originality, clarity of argument, and clarity of structure. <coughs> I'm sorry, two pages have got stuck together, and they're being very stubborn and absolutely <laughs> refusing to come apart. <coughs> The excellence of her work and the reason why she was elected sec the secretary of the Corpus Inscriptionum is because of her brilliant linguistic skills. And so is very fortunate to have a scholar of her calibre on the staff. Tonight's lecture is on the subject of great debate in the current world of Zoroastrian studies. There are at least three interrelated questions behind what she's talking about. First of all, did Zoroaster introduce a new religion or did he reform an old one? Secondly, to what extent should Zoroaster's teaching be interpreted in the light of the Indo-Iranian parallels as evidenced in the Vedas? Thirdly, did Zoroaster exist or was he simply a mythological figure created by later members of the religion? The first two questions are exemplified by the contrasting <coughs> starting point of two relatively recent authors. Zainer, in his 1961 book, The Dawn and Twilight of Zoroastrianism, started his account of Zoroastrianism with Zoroaster and his vision. He did not consider it was necessary to introduce any account of the earlier Indo-Iranian religion because he thought Zoroastrianism was a new religion drawn straight from Zoroaster's visions. In contrast, Mary Boyce, in her 1975 book, The History of Zoroastrianism, Volume 1, had five chapters on the ancient Indo-Iranian tradition, because she thought as a trained priest in the old tradition, he would have been deeply, deeply influenced by that tradition, and that he was immersed in it and his visions deployed much of the ancient material. So Zainer saw what Zoroaster had done to introduce a dramatic change, a new religion. Boyce, Boyce thought there was substantial continuity. She went on to argue there was continuity between Zoroaster and his followers, for example in the later Middle Persian books. But that's another question. For the third question tonight, is an example of postmodern thought. Was there a human being, Zoroaster, who propounded his own personal and individual religious experience, or is he a later community myth? These questions involve a detailed study of the literary style and structure of the Gathas. 
by looking in particular at the figure of the horror master and the Davers and their respective roles, Professor Hintzer addresses the first two questions and overall she looks back at the third question. She is therefore engaging through a detailed linguistic study with some vibrant debates that are taking place in modern Zoroastrian studies. Professor Hintz, will you now please deliver your inaugural lecture, lecture Change and Continuity in the Zoroastrian Tradition. Thank you. Sorry, I'm just waiting for Professor Hinnels and the director to come through. I would like to dedicate this lecture to Mehraban Sartoshti and to the memory of his brother, Faridun, and to that of Professor Mary Boyce. Lord Billy Moria, Professor Webley, colleagues and friends, ladies and gentlemen. The Zoroastrians love for superlatives the first, the oldest, the best, the smallest, is not least inspired by some basic facts relating to their religion. Going back as far as the second millennium BCE and rooted in Indo-Iranian prehistory, Zoroastrianism is one of the most ancient living traditions, although its community today is microscopically small. An estimated 130,000 adherents worldwide. Most of them live in India, particularly in Mumbai and Gujarat, where they became known as Parsis because they originally came from Persia. They had started to leave Iran for India in the 7th century of the Christian era after the last Zoroastrian Empire, the Sasanian state, had succumbed to Arab Muslim invaders. Between 10 to 30,000 Zartoshtis are estimated to be living in Iran today, with the rest in a global diaspora, especially in the English-speaking world, the oldest center being here in London. Characteristic of the Zoroastrian religion are two towering figures, the god Ahura Mazda, usually translated as Lord Wisdom, and the man Zarathustra to whom Ahura Mazda revealed the Mazda-worshipping or Mazda-Yasnian religion. As the name suggests, the focus of this religion is the worship of Ahura Mazda. To this day, such worship typically takes the form of priestly and lay rituals in which the performance of precisely prescribed actions accompanies the recitation of texts composed in an ancient Iranian language called Avestan. The most important ritual and the core of all the other major priestly ritual, rituals is called worship or yasna. 
The text recited during the Yasna ceremony consists of 72 sections, which have at their center 17 hymns, the gathas, and a liturgy in seven sections, the Yasna Haptang Haiti. Since the language of this composite center is more archaic than that of the surrounding material, scholars distinguish it from the latter as the older Avesta. The younger Avesta is not only linguistically more recent, but it's also evidence of a more advanced state of the religi religion's development. It is comprised of invocations, hymns, and purity laws composed at different periods of the oral tradition. These younger Avestan texts reach the petrified form in which they have come down to the present day, sometime between 1000 and 500 BC. The Gathas and the Yasna Haptang Haiti must be older, composed probably between 1500 and 1000 BCE. They constitute the oldest extant witness, not only of the Zoroastrian religion, but also of any Iranian language. Up to the present, no other texts of the Zoroastrian tradition are held as dearly as the Gathas by both <coughs> priests and lay people. Even today, most Zoroastrians will know at least some stanzas by heart in the original Avestan language as they recite them in their daily prayers. Moreover, the Gathas and the Yasna Haptang Haiti served as sources for many of the younger Avestan liturgical compositions and are frequently quoted verbatim to give greater authority to the later younger Avestan texts. A connection between Zarathustra and the Gathas emerges from the fact that he features in them as the major human character. Moreover, on two occasions, the speaker, the I, identifies himself by name as Zarathustra. Such a connection is reinforced in the younger Avesta, which mentions the five gathas of Zarathustra and represents him as reciting them while performing the Yasna ritual. Thus, not only the gathas, but also the later tradition links these hymns with the Zarathustra. Furthermore, the younger Avesta presents Zarathustra as the individual to whom Ahura Mazda communicated the Mazda-worshipping religion, the Daina Mazda Yasni, so that he could pass it on to the rest of humanity. The figure of Zarathustra thus connects the Mazda Yasnian religion with the Gathas, and the latter, latter are pet perceived as the earliest extant sources of the religion as illustrated in the diagram, which you can see there. According to tradition, Zarathustra composed the Gathas and brought the Mazda Yasnian religion to humankind, thus marking the beginning of this religion. Those who have accepted it declare themselves as Mazda Yasnian Zarathustrian, and that's where the name Satoshti comes from. Such a perception of Zarathustra's role, which the texts present from an insider's point of view, has led external observers to regard Zoroastrianism as a prophetic religion which was started by Zarathustra. This model has been described as historical, and many scholars have accepted it as providing a likely scenario for how the prehistoric beginnings of the Zoroastrian tradition could be imagined. In recent decades, however, an alternative model, which has been referred to as mythological, has been gaining ground amongst scholars. According to this view, Sarasustra neither composed the Gathas nor was a historical person. The Mazda worshipping religion thus has no known beginning at a certain point in time through the inter intervention of an individual. Instead, it is argued that it evolved organically over a long period out of the prehistoric Indo-Iranian religion. In this process, 
the gatas gradually cohered over time in the anonymous collective mentality of the priests <coughs> and eventually crystallized and petrified into the composition which have come down to the present day, while at the same time being handed down from one priestly generation to the next in the oral tradition. The figure of Sarasushtva, in turn, is seen as the product of priestly cosmological speculation, according to which his arrival and that of the Mazda worshipping religion marks the midpoint of cosmic history. It emerges from the summary of the two models that what is at stake here is how we should imagine the genesis of this religion. Was there really ever a religious reformer, a prophet, a person as real as you and me, as the tradition would have us believe, a human being who claimed to have received a divine revelation and initiated a new religion? Or is the figure of Sarasushtra an invention of that tradition, a fiction projected back into the past and produced by anonymous priestly cosmological speculation? At first, I was, attempted, I was tempted to adopt the current terminology and refer to the former model as historical and the latter as mythological. On reflection, however, such terminology seems to be inadequate because, in fact, myth plays a major part in both. Moreover, both models draw on the notion of history the difference being that the former allocates historical reality to both Zarathustra and the tradition, while the latter does so only to the tradition represented by the priests, the so-called poet sacrifices. It therefore seems to me that the contrast between the two models, in fact, consists not in history versus myth, as widely claimed, but rather in the way the growth of the Zoroastrian tradition is perceived. The second model operates with the assumption of a gradual but continuous development at the point where the first postulates a break in the tradition, a fundamental and presumably sudden change brought about by an individual. I therefore prefer to call the first model, perhaps somewhat pointedly, revolutionary, and the second, evolutionary. There are parallels to both in other religions. The first, revolutionary model, applies to those traditions which were started off by individuals. They include Judaism with Moses, Buddhism, Siddhartha Gautama, Christianity, Jesus of Nazareth, and Islam, Muhammad. Examples of the second evolutionary model are harder to find, but they include Hinduism. Regardless of this difference, however, change and continuity play an important part in all religions and also in both models. The traditions just mentioned, which were started off by individuals, did not emerge out of nothing but are rooted in their respective historical ancestors. In some of the more recent instances, such as Buddhism and Christianity, the historical ancestors are even documented, and it is therefore possible to study the relationship between the older and the younger religions. In the case of Zoroastrianism, we are in the fortunate position of having the evidence of a sister belief system, the Vedic religion of ancient India. Thanks to this comparative evidence, we are able to identify features which the two traditions share in common and which are therefore likely to be archaisms inherited from their common Indo-Iranian ancestor. We are thus able to know a little about the prehistoric world from which Zoroastrianism emerged. However, it is the innovations which serve, so to speak, as <coughs> index fossils or isoglosses for identifying features which are peculiar to Zoroastrianism. 
But the question remains, how did the innovations of Zoroastrianism come about? Did they evolve organically out of the Indo-Iranian ancestor, or did an individual intervene? Or should we consider a combination of the two models and assume that some innovations already in process were accelerated by an individual? If you are now hoping that the ultimate answer will emerge from this lecture, <laughs> I'm afraid I have to disappoint you. While the notions of myth and historical reality, of fiction and truth, are subject to extensive and ongoing theoretical debates, the nature and age of our source material, which of of some of which takes us into Central Asia of the second millennium BCE, simply do not allow us to be certain one way or the other. Some of you might be inclined to interpret <coughs> such lack of proof as revealing a weakness of our discipline, but we will do better if we turn it into a virtue and regard it as an opportunity for applying certain transferable sought-after skills in which students of the humanities are trained. For, in the absence of even the possibility of verifying or refuting our results, we have to examine our sources like detectives looking for clues which might enable us to argue in favor of the probability and the plausibility of one theory over against the other. Most of recent scholarship on our problem has focused on archaisms in the Zoroastrian tradition, that is to say on features which it shares with the Vedic religion and which go well with the evolutionary model. However, in order to find out the more probable scenario which will account for the growth of Zoroastrianism, we need to look at the innovations. For it is not continuity, but change, which requires an explanation. In this talk, I propose to focus on one particular well-known innovation, which is central and distinctive of the Zoroastrian tradition, the rejection and eventual demonization of the old Indo-Iranian gods, the, the divers, and the concomitant elevation of Ahura Mazda as the only god to be worshipped. In Indo-Iranian prehistory, the word for god was diva. The noun characterizes the gods as the heavenly ones, and lives on as Deva in the closely related Vedic and Hindu, Hindu cultures, and in many other Indo-European languages, such as Latin Deus and the adjective Divinus, from which we get the English divine. In all Indo-European languages except Iranian, Deva means God. But in the Zoroastrian tradition, Deva has the opposite meaning. In the Gathas, it signifies a false or a fake god, while in the younger Avestan, in addition, a demon. The divas are a major concern in the Gathas. One of the 17 hymns, Yasna 32, is virtually entirely devoted to this theme. In the opening stanza, three constituents of ancient Iranian society namely the family, the community, and the entire Aryan tribe, ask Ahura Mazda for his gift of bliss or happiness. In this request, they are joined by a fourth group, the gods of old, the Daiva. The family asks for his happiness. The community, together with the Aryan tribe, asks for his happiness. In my manner, the fake gods ask for his happiness, for the happiness of the wise lord. We want to be your messengers in order to restrain those who are hostile to you. In the verse which follows, Ahura Mazda speaks and responds to the requests. First, he addresses the family, community, and Aryan tribe, accepting their right-mindedness, Armaiti. 
the wise lord, uniting himself with good thought and in the good company of sun filled truth, answered them according to his rule. We choose your life giving good right mindedness. She shall be ours. But in the next verse, he rejects the fourth group, the divers. But you, fake gods, all of you are seed from bad thought. And so also is the one who greatly worships you. See from deceit and neglect are moreover the repeated actions by which you are known in the seventh part of the earth. These lines are perhaps the strongest expression in the entire Avesta of the outright rejection, first, of a whole set of deities, divas, second, of those who worship them, and third, of the ritual practices by which such deities are worshipped. Thus, the gods, their followers, and the associated cultic and religious practices are here declared by Ahura Mazda to originate from bad thought. To ensure that the rejection is wholesale and complete, the divers are comprehensively referred to as Daiva Vispong Ho, all the divers. It has long been recognized that the expression corresponds also in an inverted word, word order to the Vedic Vishve Deva, all the gods, in the tradition of ancient India, which shares a common heritage with the Iranian people. For example, in the Rig in Rig Veda 652.7, O oh, all gods, come here, listen to my call. Sit down at this sacrificial straw here. In the Gothic hymn, by contrast, not only the old word for god, Daiva, has a negative meaning, but the gods of old are declared to originate from bad thought. Thus, in contrast to the prehistoric Indo-Iranian religion, where the divas are the gods, in the earliest sources of the Zoroastrian religion, the Gathas, the divas are products of evil, of bad thought. They are thus subordinate and secondary to that destructive force. The downgrading of the gods of earlier generations and their subordination to another force forms part of a system in which everything that exists is aligned either with the camp of good or with that of evil. These two distinct groups are mutually exclusive and diametrically opposed to one another. At the apex of the good camp is the god Ahura Mazda, by birth, as the Gathas put it, out of himself, he, he brings out of himself spiritual qualities, such as creative force, fo force, spenta mind you, truth, masha, good thought, wahumana, and right-mindedness, armaiti. In a second stage of creation, he makes the material world out of such spiritual qualities. Both the spiritual and the material worlds are thus, ulti thus ultimately originate from Ahura Mazda and are therefore perfect and wholly good. His material creation is called the world of truth, Asha, and anyone who supports it is Asha one, truthful. Moreover, everything and everyone belonging to Ahura Mazda's world is worthy of worship, Yazata. This includes pre-Zoroastrian deities such as Mithra, Anahita and Hauma, who have now been incorporated into the good camp. None of the Yazatas is a cultic competitor of Ahura Mazda. Rather, the opposite is the case. The cult of any Yazata supports and strengthens Ahura Mazda. Furthermore, not only is the cult of a Yazata legitimate, but Ahura Mazda demands that each of them be worshipped. For example, at the beginning of the hymn to Mithra, of God contract, Ahura Mazda enjoins his cult. Ahura Mazda said to Spitama Zarathustra, when I set forth Mithra of white cattle pastures, O Spitama, then I made him as much worthy of worship, as much worthy of praise as myself, Ahura Mazda. The Indo-Iranian deity, Mithra, is aligned with a good camp and his worship legitimized by and subordinated to Ahura Mazda. Just as the divers originate from and are subordinated to bad thought, 
So Mithra and any other yasata originates from and is subordinated to the greatest and best of all of them, Ahura Mazda. The yasata system thus enables the religion to absorb both, both old and new deities and perpetuate their cultic worship without threatening the supremacy of Ahura Mazda. Indeed, the more Yasatas there are, the better, as they all strengthen Ahura Mazda and simultaneously weaken the evil camp. The genesis and structure of the evil camp is formulated in parallel but negative terms. At its apex is the destructive force, Angra Mainyu. From a systematic point of view, however, Angra Mainyu constitutes the negation not of Ahura Mazda himself, since he does not have a negative counterpart, but of his creative force, Spunta Mainyu. Angra Mainyu produces out of himself bad qualities, such as deceit, Druj, bad thought, Akamana, and arrogance, Taramaiti. Evil forces are described as unworthy of worship, Ayesnia, and those who associate themselves with them are deceitful, Druvant. In addition, the divers are associated with the bad camp, and they include some gods inherited from Indo-Iranian times, such as Indra. They are the product of Angra Mainyu, who is the diver of the divers. There is no evidence in the Zoroastrian tradition that the destructive force, Angra Mainyu, was ever a culty competitor of Ahura Mazda. He is but an enemy who counteracts everything Ahura Mazda does and who needs to be destroyed. Furthermore, already in the Gathas, the divers are described as obnoxious creatures, as hrastras, and the tendency to downgrade and belittle them as nasty and detestable demons whom no sensible person would ever consider worshipping continues in the younger Avesta and later in the Pahlavi literature. Yet, the downgrading of the old Indo-Iranian gods as products of that destructive force could be interpreted as a device to weaken and incapacitate Ahura Mazda's real competitors, namely the old Indo-Iranian gods, the divers. For our sources provide evidence that the divers were indeed serious culty competitors for Ahura Mazda, not only at the time of the Gathas, but also later on in the history of the Zoroastrian tradition. In addition to the two camps, Daiva and Yazata, the Avesta also distinguishes between two groups of people, those whose Yasna is for the Daivas, the Daiva Yasna, and those whose Yasna is for Mazda, the Mazda Yasna. As a cognate of Vedic Yajna, sacrifice, worship, the Avestan word Yasna is also inherited from Indo-Iranian. The same is true of the compound Daiva Yasna and the corresponding Vedic Deva Yajna. A Western diver yasna is an adjective and describes a person as someone whose sacrifice is for the false god, gods. The compound Mazda yasna, however, has no equivalent in Vedic. Being characteristic of the Zoroastrian tradition, it is a more recent formation and was probably formed on the model of the older diver yasna. Both diver yasna and Mazda yasnas perform cultic worship, but the yasna of the former group is directed towards the old gods, the divas, while that of the latter is for Mazda. It is not the yasna as such, but its recipient that constitutes the distinctive and contrasting feature of the two groups. There is one Avestan hymn, that to Anahita, in which the deity is recipient of sacrifices, not only of Mazda yasnas, but on four occasions also of Daiva Yasnas. For example, the Mazda Yasna Vishtaspa offers to Anahita sacrifices of a hundred stallions, a thousand bulls, and ten thousand sheep, just like his arch enemy, the Daiva Yasna Arjat Aspa. The tradition tells us that the Mazda Yasna Vishtaspa accepted Zarathustra's teachings 
became his royal patron and provided decisive support for the new religion by fighting and winning battles against the enemies. By contrast, Arajat Aspa and other Daiva Yasnas tried to obstruct the spreading of the new religion. Vishtaspa implores the deity to grant him success in his battles against the Daiva Yasnas and in particular victory over Arjat Aspa and other enemies, while Arjat Aspa in turn, as he sacrifices to the same deity in the same manner, wishes to defeat Vishtaspa and smite the Aryan people. Of course, the goddess does not grant any of the wishes of the bad ones, but does grant those of Vishtaspa. The two sacrifices are carried out in exactly the same way, and some of the words of the sacrifices' prayers are even identical, but the former is successful and the latter is not. Success is determined neither by the form and manner in which the sacrifice is performed, nor by the recipient but by the purpose of the ritual. Here, as in the other three unsuccessful attempts in this hymn, the suppliant's wishes are directed against Ahura Mazda's plan to establish the Daina Mazda Yasni in this world. For the three enemies of Vishtaspa are identified by their attribute as belonging to the bad camp. Tasriyavant of bad belief and Pushana, whose worship is of the Daivas, and deceitful Arjat Aspa. The Avestan word for belief, religion, Daina, literally means perception or vision. Also the verb Di corresponds to Vedic Dihi, and both mean to see in one's mind, to see with an inner eye. The noun Daina, from which we get new Persian Deen, religion, is confined to Iranian. Like Mazda Yasna, it is a Zoroastrian technical term and denotes the way a person interprets the meaning and purpose of his or her life. There is a good and a bad diner. Worshippers of Mazda are who diner of good belief and their diner is Mazda Yasni, that is, the belief which belongs to a person who, wor who worships Mazda. The expression entails an in individual. By contrast, the anonymous group, an anonymous group is implied by the equivalent negative term, the Daina of those who worship the divas, the Daina Daiva Yasna Nam. It applies to people like Arajat Aspa, who are therefore Duj Daina of bad belief. They are evil and deceitful, and that is Druvant because of their Daina. In addition to Daiva Yasnas and Mazda Yasnas offering up competing sacrifices to the same deity with diametrically opposed requests, the texts also present the two groups as living in close proximity to one another. In the younger Avestan, rules for keeping away the divas, the Videvdad, Sarasushtva asks Ahura Mazda whether Mazda worshippers aspiring to become surgeons should test their surgical skills first on Mazda or on Daiva worshippers. The answer is, then said Ahura Mazda, let them first try out their skills on Daiva worshippers rather than on Mazda worshippers. If for the first time he operates on a Daiva worshipper, and he dies because of that. If for the second time he operates on a diver worshipper and he dies because of that. If for the third time he operates on a diver worshipper and he dies before, because of that, then as a result, such a person will be unfit forever and ever. <laughs> the text then goes on and states that if in spite of having failed the three tests, the aspiring surgeon still operates on Mazda worshippers and harms his patient, then such a person is liable for deliberate bodily injury. Only if three Daiva worshippers survive the operation may the candidate operate on Mazda worshippers. 
if for the first time he operates on a diver worshipper and he survives, if for the second time he operates on a diver worshipper and he survives, if for the third time he operates on a diver worshipper and he survives, then as a result of this, he will be fit forever and ever. At will shall they subsequently attend as physicians to Mazda worshippers. At will let them operate on Mazda worshippers. At will let them heal by means of the knife. The passage shows that the life of a diver worshipper is considered to be of little value and serves at best for experiments. Moreover, physically harming another person is prosecuted only if the victim is one who worships Mazda rather than divers. The teaching is given divine authority by means of the literary form in which all the Avesta is couched, that is, the question and answer mode of dialogue between Zarathustra and his god Ahura Mazda. Evidence for conflict and competition between Mazda and Daiva worshippers is found not only throughout the Avesta, but also in a non-religious source from the early 5th century BCE, the so-called Daiva inscription by the Achaemenid king Xerxes I, who ruled the Persian Empire from 486 to 465 BCE. The inscription exists in three versions, Babylonian, Elamite, and Old Persian. It was found at Persepolis in 1935 and is a major witness for the Daiva cult in Zoroastrian Iran, independent of the Avesta. In this inscription, Xerxes proudly records that he destroyed diverse places of worship in the lands which formed part of his vast empire and that he replaced their worship with that of Ahura Mazda. Among those countries, there were some where formerly the divers had been worshipped. Afterwards, by the will of Ahura Mazda, I destroyed that place of the divers and I gave orders the divers shall not be worshipped any longer. Wherever formerly the divers had been worshipped, there I worshipped Ahura Mazda in accord with truth at the sacrificial straw. The experts amongst you will notice that I have here returned to the old interpretation of Brasmania in line 41 as sacrificial straw. The expression Ertacha Brasmania occurs three times in this text. If the first part, Ertacha, represents as widely assumed Ertahacha in accord with truth, with Avestan rather than Persian word order, then one would expect an Avestan connection also for the second part. Such connection is supported by the fact that the Babylonian and Elamite versions do not translate but simply transliterate the old Persian form. Also, the Elamite transcription favors the reading Brasmania rather than Barzmania. A Western liturgical formulae show that the sacrificial straw, a Western Barzman, is not a minor detail of the cult, as has been claimed, but plays a major part in the Yasna ritual. For example, in Yasna 2.2, at this libation and sacrificial straw, I bring here with worship Ahura Mazda, the truthful model of truth. Moreover, Mazda Yasnians are described as worshipping their Yazatas with Barusman in their hands. For example, in Yasht 5, around whom, that is Anahita, the Mazda worshippers took position with Barusman in their hands. The Huvovas worshipped her, the Nautiorias worshipped her, etc. And a gold plaque from the Achaemenid period represents a presumably, presumably Zoroastrian priest holding Barisman twigs in his right hand. At any rate, as in the Avesta, in the Daiva inscription, the Daivas are Ahura Mazda's direct cultic competitors. Xerxes presents himself as the royal defender of Ahura Mazda's cult 
just as Vishtaspa does in the Avesta. So far, we have seen that even at the time when Zoroastrianism was well established in Iranian lands, the Daiwas were not merely vile demons, but also real gods who received cultic worship. We have found traces of the old meaning in the Avestan expression Daiva Yasna, which is inherited <coughs> from Indo-Iranian, and it is it is very unlikely that a Daiva Yasna should worship an evil being such as Angra Mainyu or any of his creatures. Rather, it denotes a person who worshiped the old gods, the Daivas. The four episodes in Yasht 5 in which Daiva Yasna sacrifice unsuccessfully to the Yasata Anahita suggests that Anahita is, like Mithra, a pre-Zoroastrian goddess who came to be incorporated into the Yasata camp. The episodes illustrate that the success of the ritual is determined by the sacrifice's daina, the belief, that is to say, whether the worshipper believes in the daivas or in Mazda. The episode which we discussed of daiva yasnas serving as guinea pigs for aspiring Mazda yasnian surgeons suggests that daiva yasnas and Mazda yasnas lived in close proximity to one another. It also illustrates the Mazda Yasnian perception that the value of a Daiva Yasna's life is negligible. Such an estimation is based on the view that Daiva Yasnas support the evil camp. Furthermore, in Xerxes' inscription, we have seen evidence for the Daivas as cultic competitors of Ahura Mazda, even in historical times, the 5th century BCE. The existence of Daiva establishments Daiva Danas, which Xerxes raised to the ground, indicates that the worship of the pre Zoroastrian gods continued in the Aryan lands. The evidence of the Daiva inscription is particularly valuable for uh, the religious history of Iran because it is a historical monument from outside the religious tradition of the Avesta. Its mindset, however, and even some of its wording, as we have seen, is fully in line with the Avesta. Evidence for the old meaning of Daiva as God also survives in some Soktian personal names. Such names must have been formed at a time when Daiva meant God, at least for those who formed them. The people who did so could have been what the Avesta calls Daiva Yasnas, who lived, as we have seen, alongside Mazda Yasnas. Of particular interest is the name <coughs> Dev Ashtich, given to a king who ruled at Samarkand in the 8th century of the Christian era and whose archives of legal and economic documents were found at the castle on Mount Moob, east of Samarkand. That the meaning of the name had become opaque to the Soktian speakers of the 8th century of the Christian era, from which uh, the documents date, and probably long before emerges from its non-onomastic function in the form of the adjective Dev Ashtich, for the adjective's meaning has undergone demonization. It means devilish, Ahrimanian, and functions as the antonym of Ahur Mastich, Ahura Mazdian. While Xerxes and Kavivishtaspa appear from our sources as those who fight with Daiva worshippers and defend the cult of Mazda against that of the Daivas, Zarathustra is the one who takes on the Daivas directly. In the Zarathustra myth, the Daivas are presented as, being hostile, as beings hostile to Ahura Mazda's creation. They have always been around and, being the issue of Angra Mainyu, they have always been bad. The Gathas relate that in primordial times, the divers were given the choice between the life-giving and the destructive force, and they chose the latter. Between these two forces, the fake god, gods, the divers, indeed failed to discriminate rightly, because as they were deliberating with one another, deception came over them, so that they chose the worst thought. Thereupon, they rushed into violence, by which they sicken the existence of the mortal. <coughs> Before Zarathustra was born, there was no way of keeping the divers under control. 
They went about unrestrained and violently attacked human beings. One particular aspect which the Avesta highlights and which is also found in later representations of the devs, for example, in manuscripts of the Shahnameh uh, of the Safavid period, is their lascivious behavior with one another. Moreover, they assaulted and raped women. Before this, his time, that's before Zarathustra's time, the demons used to rush about visibly. Their pleasures of lust used to take place visibly. Visibly, they used to drag the women away from their men. And the demons used to subject to violence those crying and lamenting women. But a single Ahuna Vairya prayer, which truthful Zarathustra recited, divided four times into sections. The last section, with louder recitation, drove under the earth all demons which are unworthy of worship, unworthy of praise. Here and elsewhere, Zarathustra's weapon against the divas is the Ahuna Vairya prayer. The latter, in fact, constitutes the first stanza of the first gata. Thus, here, too, the gathas are connected with the figure of Zarathustra. In the course of the tradition, this prayer came to be regarded as the holiest of all Zoroastrian prayers. It is believed to encapsulate, in a nutshell, all the knowledge of the Avesta, of the Daina Mazdayasni. The texts tell us that Zarathustra was born, the son of Purushaspa, and that the Daivas dreaded him. They realized their defeat at the moment of his birth, since they say, born indeed is truthful Zarathustra of the house of Purushaspa. How shall we procure his destruction? He is the weapon against the Daivas. He is the antagonist of the Daivas. He is a deceit-free one against deceit. Vanished are the diver worshippers. Vanished is the decay made by the divers. Vanished is the false speaking lie. Zarathustra is thus the arch enemy of the divers because he curbs their unrestrained rule. It is with his birth that the divers withdraw, run away, hide under the earth. The weapon by which he drives the divers underground is the Dainamas Dayasni in the form of the Ahuna Vairya prayer. The internal perception, as expressed in the Zarathustra myth, divides the time continuum into a period before and one after Zarathustra. His birth constitutes a watershed which marks the turning point in cosmic history. The divers have always been bad and their badness constitutes an unchanging continuum. But they were powerful only at the time before Zarathustra. They lost their power when Zarathustra brought the weapon in the form of the Mazda worshipping religion for fighting them successfully. The change here consists in the divers losing their power. Contrary to what the Zarathustra myth would have us believe, from the external perspective, the divers cannot always have been bad for, on the basis of the comparative evidence, we know that in Indo-Iranian, Daiva must at one stage have meant God. From the external point of view, we observe that the Daivas were gods in Indo-Iranian, but were rejected and demonized in Iranian. Because of the positive meaning of Daiva in all non-Iranian languages, their demonization must have happened after the Indo-Iranians had split into two separate peoples, a process which archaeological evidence and relative chronology indicate to have happened around 2000 BCE. The external perspective, therefore, postulates a semantic redefinition of the meaning of Daiva at some point after the breaking up of the Indo-Iranian community. While both perspectives envisage a change for the worse affecting the divers, they define its substance differently. From the inside perspective, the change consists in the divers losing power, while from the outside point of view, 
diver changes its meaning from God to false god or demon. The divers lose prestige. As to the question how the change came about, the inside perspective attributes it to Zarathustra and also offers a reason why it happened. It was due to the arrival of the new religion, the worship of Mazda. From the external perspective, we have to account for how and why the meaning of diver changed from God to demon, to false, false God and demon. The explanation of how such a semantic redefinition came about is the bone of contention between the revolutionary and the evolutionary models presented at the beginning of this lecture. The revolutionary model attributes the change to Zarathustra and explains it by the introduction of the new religion, thus appropriating answers to the questions how and why from the inside perspective. By contrast, the evolutionary model assumes that the meaning of Daiva gradually changed from God to demon. Instead of a sudden change, a gradual one is thus assumed, but no attempt is made to account for such a leisurely development. Also, Daiva has a negative denotation throughout virtually the whole of the Iranian-speaking world. The assumption of a gradual change of Daiva from God to demon could be supported by reference to its occasional, occasional positive meaning in Sogdian onomastics, together with the Avestan and Old Persian evidence that the cult of the Daivas continued in Iran and competed with that of Mazda well into historical times. Moreover, the Avesta attests to the gradual spreading of the Mazda Yasmian religion among the Iranian people and to missionary activity of the Mazda worshippers. However, not only the fact that the gods of old are rejected, but especially the vehement way in which this is done and the uncompromising attitude which does not tolerate the divers points to a major, indeed a violent break in the religious history of the Iranian people. The rejection and demonization of the divers <coughs> and their cult in the Avesta has all the features which characterize a monotheistic movement whereby the elevation of one deity, in our case Ahura Mazda, is concomitant with the rejection of all the other gods. The internal perspective tries to deal with the fact that once upon a time the divas were god by representing them <coughs> as having always been bad and by making them the products of bad thought. That this was a struggle emerges from the way, as we have seen, in which Daiva worshippers are represented in the Avesta and in the Xerxes inscription. From the outside perspective, therefore, a, repu a repudiation of the former gods and the accompanying exaltation of Ahura Mazda make a sudden and deliberate, rather than a gradual and organic change, more probable. Proponents of the evolutionary model have criticized adherents of the revolutionary one for borrowing the figure of Zarathustra as religious innovator from the inside perspective. But, it is true that the Zarathustra myth is unavailable as a source for the outside perspective as long as myth <laughs> is defined as pure fiction, as a set of unexamined assumptions. But as soon as one allows for the possibility that factual material may, over time, acquire elements of fiction and be gradually transformed into myth, then myth may, in fact, encapsulate historical reality and experience and truth. The Zarathustra, myth then the Zarathustra myth then acquires explanatory force for the outside perspective of how and why the divers were demonized and the figure of Zarathustra becomes pivotal again. 
we have thus finally arrived at Zarathustra, and with him at the older Avesta, the Gathas in particular. Recent research has revealed the sophisticated poetic devices and compositional structure of the Gathas, their personal character and tone, and evidence for an individual speaking with religious authority and charisma, all of which is without parallel in the Rig Veda. Just listen to this. I shall proclaim the principle of this life, the formulation which the knowing one, the wise Lord, has told me. Those of you who do not put into practice this formulation here as I shall think and speak it, to them, woe will be the conclusion of life. Further study of old Avestan poetry on the one hand and on the other of myth and historical reality in relation to the Zarathustra legend could throw further light on the origins of the Zoroastrian tradition, but this will be the topic of another lecture. Tonight, I have deliberately steered away from the, from the figure of Zarathustra and focused not on this contested figure, but on the substance of the most important change which separates the Zoroastrian tradition from its Indo-Iranian ancestor. That is, the demonization of the old gods and the elevation of Ahura Mazda as the only god to be worshipped. I thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, it is an honor and a heartfelt pleasure to present a short synopsis of the main aspects of Professor Hintz's lecture, especially since the subject matter of her elaborate discussion is of eminent importance for our common field of Iranian studies. She poses a fundamental question regarding the genesis of the Zoroastrian or Mazdayasnian religion, which has been the subject of vehement controversies in recent research. Was there a historical person called Zarathustra, a religious reformer or prophet responsible for the beginning of a new tradition associated with his name? Or is the figure of Zarathustra a fiction of this tradition invented by priests and projected back into the past. She does not aspire to offer an ultimate answer to this difficult problem, but proposes to examine the text in minute detail in search of the most probable and plausible interpretation. According to Iranian sources, Zarathustra is the one individual who, after having received a divine revelation by the god Ahura Mazda, leads humankind to the master-worshipping religion by the means of the Gathas, the oldest hymns of the ritual composed by the prophet himself. Due to his decisive part in establishing the tradition, observers from the outside, from outside this tradition, have accepted him as a historical person and as the initiator of the religion known by his name. In recent decades, this model, labeled as historical, has been questioned by scholars who neither accept Zarathustra as the composer of the Gathas, nor as a historical person. <coughs> According to a second model, referred to as mythological, the master worshiping religion evolved over a long period of time out of the prehistoric Indo-Iranian religion. The priests, the so-called poet sacrificers were the anonymous composers of the Gathas and also invented the figure of Zarathustra within the framework of cosmological speculations. 
Almut Hinze questions the current terms used to designate the two models. The contrast between them is not that between history versus mythology, since both models include myths and draw, draw on the notion of history. But rather, the contrast consists in the manner the growth of the Zoroastrian tradition is perceived. She describes the second model as evolutionary, since it assumes a continuous and gradual development from the common Indo-Iranian religious tradition to the Iranian one. The first model, on the other hand, is revolutionary, since it postulates a break in this process, a sudden important change caused by an individual. Arguing that not continuity, but change requires an explanation, Professor Hinze focuses her discussion on one of the most prominent features of Zoroastrianism, the rejection of the gods of the Indo-Iranian pantheon called the Daivas. In contrast to the prehistoric Indo-Iranian religion in which the Daivas are gods, the earliest Zoroastrian sources, the Gathas, present them as products of evil and reject not the whole set of deities, but also those who worship them and their ritual practices. These gods are downgraded, and the term daiva takes on the meaning of false or fake god in the Gathas, and demon in the younger Avesta and later sources. Professor Hinze provides evidence that the daivas were in fact serious cultic competitors of Ahura Mazda at the time of the Gathas, and also later on in the history of the Zoroastrian tradition. The sources also allow the conclusion that worshippers of Mazda and the Daivas lived in close proximity. In the Zoroastrian myth, it is Zarathustra himself who takes on the struggle with the Daivas by using the weapon of the Ahunavairya prayer which constitutes the first stanza of the first Gatha, thus connecting the Gathas to the figure of Zarathustra. There is a discrepancy in how the Daivas are perceived in the Zoroastrian myth on the one hand and the scholarly discussion on the other. From the inside point of view of Zoroastrian texts, the Daivas have always been evil, but their rule is ended by Zarathustra and the advent of the Mazdayasnian religion. Time is clearly divided into periods before and after Zarathustra. He marks the turning point in history by introducing the Mazda worshiping religion as the means of fighting the divers successfully. The scholarly or outside perspective, by contrast, postulates that the divers were rejected and demonized after the breaking up of the Indo-Iranian community. However, both the revolutionary and the evolutionary models still have to explain how and why the meaning of the word changed from God to false God and demon. Whereas the revolutionary model follows the inside perspective and attributes the change to Zarathustra and his introduction of the new religion, the evolutionary model assumes that a gradual change of the word's meaning took place, but is not able to explain why. Professor Hinze concludes that although there is evidence for the continuing cult of the divas in Iran, the vehement manner in which these gods are rejected in the Gathas points to a sudden break in the religious history of the Iranians rather than an unexplained gradual change of perspective. I would like to thank Almut for allowing us to partake in her meticulous research and for innovative, comprehensive, and convincing lecture.